Hi, some of you may have seen me before. My name is Kristen Costas, Director of Product Management at Lytix and Chapter Lead for the San Diego Chapter of Women in Product. Welcome back to the Leadership That Illuminates stage. In this next session, we're gonna be focusing in on optimizing team management, pivot with purpose. Before I do that and welcome our speakers, I wanna take a quick moment to thank our sponsors without whom this event would not be possible. As I mentioned, this next session is gonna be all about pivoting with purpose. And we're gonna hear from three great product leaders. Up first, we have Shivani Berry. Shivani is the CEO and founder of Ascend. Ascend is an online leadership program designed to empower women to reach their goals and advance into leadership roles. Prior to founding Ascend, Shivani was a product leader in tech. She will be sharing her experience and expertise with us with her talk titled, Get Buy-In, Maximizing Influence at Work. Please join me in welcoming Shivani to the stage. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Before we dive in, I have three questions for you. Put a yes in the chat if the answer to any of these questions is a yes. Question one, put a yes is if you've tried to get your team to support your idea, but failed. They didn't agree to going with what you're recommending. Me, I've been there. Second question, put a yes in the chat is if you're not sure how to get buy-in from your stakeholders. Lots of yeses. Okay, perfect. We're going to dive into this today. Last question. Put a yes in the chat if you want to have your ideas heard and valued. I've definitely been there. I struggled with all of these things. Hi, everyone. I'm Shivani. I am the CEO and founder of Ascend. We offer an online leadership program for women. What inspired me to start Ascend is I used to be in your shoes. I used to lead and own different product and business initiatives at large companies like PayPal and high growth startups. As I moved up into people management, I learned how to get buy-in and motivate my teams by honestly making a lot of mistakes. Some guidance, but primarily a lot of mistakes. And once I developed these critical skills, I learned I gained more confident. I was able to grow faster in my career and impact not only my teams, but also our executives and our company's board of directors. These experiences combined with the time I spent studying at Harvard Business School to get my MBA inspired me to start Ascend. I want to elevate more women into leadership. I think that is a big way that we see the change that we need to see in today's workplaces. I realize that we currently learn these critical skills to lead and influence by trial and error. We all know that we should get people invested in our ideas, that we should speak up, push back against dominant personalities, advocate for ourselves. But we often don't for three big reasons. One, we don't cover at the time. Two, we don't know how to get started. Or three, we're scared. Because practicing these skills at work is high stakes. If you make a mistake, it can hurt your reputation or worse. That's why I created a Sense Leadership Program, a six week program for women like you to push out of your comfort zone and learn these critical skills to lead and influence, give feedback, overcome imposter syndrome in a safe space and build lasting habits with the community of other women. And it's been amazing to see women from companies like Google, DoorDash, Peloton, Slack, come out of the program, gaining more confidence, moving up in their career, including getting promoted and getting buy-in at work. So today we're going to dive into more on how to get buy-in at work. First, I want to just align on why getting buy-in is important. Because it's not enough for you to have a great idea. You have to get people to truly believe it, to rally behind it. And you might be thinking like, yeah, yeah, I know that. That's why I'm here. Well, before we talk about how to get buy-in, let's just first remind ourselves why we usually fail to get buy-in. There's three big reasons why we fail to get buy-in. One. We assume what's on our mind is obviously the right answer and it's clear to everybody else that this is the right answer. I've been guilty of this so many times. I remember one meeting I walked in as a product lead. I thought it was obvious why we should prioritize a certain feature on the roadmap. When I presented my idea, I was met with blank stares and slightly annoyed looks. The meeting did not go well. 
I realized afterwards that I hadn't taken into account that people have different contexts than me, that I hadn't walked them through my line of thinking. The second reason why we fail to get buy-in is because we think we don't have enough time. We're up against a project deadline and we don't think it's gonna to take too long to get someone on our side. And the third reason why we fail to get buy-in is for fear of disagreement. We're afraid that someone is gonna dissent. So we just wanna jam that project through before they have time to push back on us. Put a yes in the chat is if you have failed to get buy-in for any of these three reasons. Yes. Lots of guesses. I have done it for all these three reasons. So now let's dive into how you can actually get buy-in. There are six requirements that you need to do all the time to get buy-in. Around credibility, storytelling, presence, co-creation, active listening, and building allies. You can use what we're going to talk about today in any situation, up, down, or, or across. So with your team, cross-functional partners, peers, manager, senior leadership. Now let's dive into how you can embody each of these. First, credibility. Credibility is trust and expertise. So showcasing, building that trust. So people knowing that you have great intentions, people knowing that you are going to put your, their interests above yours, that you're willing to admit mistakes. Building rapport because people like to do things for people that they like. Establishing your expertise. You know what you're talking about. You have a proven track record. You have knowledge around this. You're able to ask insightful questions. If you don't have credibility, you can't get buy-in. This is the foundation for all of it. Second, storytelling. We as humans love stories. We remember stories more than we remember data and facts. And really storytelling has two big components to it. The first is your message. How do you create a narrative that is easy for your audience to follow? That really resonates with your audience. So thinking about who is my audience? What do they care about? What are their concerns gonna be? The second is your delivery. So once you have a strong message, how do you communicate it in a way that really sits well with your audience? A big part of that is being concise. So put a yes in the chat if you tend to ramble a lot. You know you need to be more succinct. Ooh, lots of people. All right, this is for you. Here's three ways you can start being concise today. First, cut the jargon and backstory. Ask yourself, what information does the stakeholder really need to know to make this decision? Cut everything else. Put in the appendix. Second, share a roadmap, share an agenda up front, number your points, point number one, point number two, point number three. And third, use active instead of passive phrases. An active phrase is this deadline, we must hit this deadline now. A passive one is deadlines are missed too often. The first one is so much stronger. So to help illustrate storytelling to you, let me tell you about Maggie. Maggie is a senior product manager at Wayfair. And recently, one of the products that she was leading had an issue come up. So the director on her team got mes messaged by many different people highlighting this issue. Because he was getting multiple pings, it looked like to him that there was many issues happening in the product. In reality, it was just one issue that many people were messaging him about. So Maggie used what she learned in a sense leadership program to better communicate with him. She took her storytelling skills that we focused on to create a message that resonated with him, that gave him the trust that she and her team had things under control. She constantly communicated to him to make sure that he knew how things were going and he knew how things were where. So when he kept getting multiple pings, he was able to respond back to others in a clear and comfortable manner. The third one is around presence. Presence is a hard term to define. It's very elusive. We know it when we see it. You can really boil it down to self-confidence. Especially in moments of stress, when you're handling questions, how do you hold yourself? How do you answer those questions? Presence is made up of a few different things. Verbal cues, your mindset is a big one, body language. Put a yes in the chat if you're guilty of saying sorry for the sake of it. 
your default is just to say sorry. Sorry, I have a question. Sorry, I have an idea. Lots of yeses. All right, this is for you. Next time, instead of saying sorry, use these phrases instead. So instead of saying sorry to bother you, just ask, do you have a moment? Why are you apologizing? If you and your colleague are working on the same project, you have the same goals, it's their responsibility also to make sure you have what you need to be successful. You'll find this table of these suggested phrases in the workshop resources. So you can print it out and refer back to it to help you get out of the habit of saying sorry. Now, of course, apologize when it's warranted. This is for when it's your default because the words that we use shape how we perceive ourselves and how others perceive us. Number four, co-creation. Co-creation is really important to get people invested in your ideas. And in order to co-create, you have to be genuinely interested in co collaborating. This means that you have to invite real debate and real discussion, meaning you can't send a cross-functional partner a deck for feedback at 4 p.m. when the meeting is at 9 a.m. the next morning. Create enough time to invite the discussion, to iterate, work together on it. You can co-create in any situation with when you're asking for more resources on your team, when you're trying to align people on how our project is going, when you're setting goals for your team, when you're pushing for a recommendation and you can co-create at any level. Now, one of the more difficult situations to co-create with is with dominant personalities. So dominant personalities are people who make us feel like our ideas aren't important. They're people who don't listen to what we have to say, who don't respect what we bring to the table. Put a yes in the chat if you've had to work with dominant personalities. I know I definitely have to work with my share. This is a big topic that we talk about and it's something really stressful. Here are three strategies that you can do to better work with dominant personalities. First, gain their respect. If you don't have their respect, it is impossible or nearly impossible to work with them. How you gain their respect? Well, first impressions matter. Come into that meeting really prepared. Know about what they care about. Position your ideas in a way that is serving them also. Part of gaining their respect is leveraging allies. So having people who have that credibility already vouching for you, showing why are you the best person for to listen to around this? What experience do you have? What is your role in this situation? And the third is don't take things personally. Often when a dominant personality pushes back on us or seems to ignore us, it's not about us. Maybe for them, they are had a bad day or they're stressed about something or they don't even realize how they're making you feel. While this behavior is not okay, even just recognizing that this is not about you can be so empowering. Because often in these meetings we go in and we feel anxious, stressed, nervous. But if you know it's not about you, that makes you feel so much stronger in the moment. So practice this, remind yourself in this moment and you'll feel more comfortable going to these conversations. To help illustrate what co-creation looks like, let me introduce you to Magda. Magda is in a business development manager at LinkedIn. She completed a sense leadership program last year and had the situation come up during the program where she had a, so she works with the engineering team to implement partnerships that she's worked on. She and the engineering manager had decided on what is the roadmap for the quarter. About halfway through the quarter, a new partnership opportunity came up out of the blue. It was a great opportunity for the company. So Magda went back to the engineer manager. I was like, we have this opportunity. Can you help us? And his response back was like, we already aligned on the roadmap. Like, why are we changing things? And so she used co-creation to help him align on, understand why is this a great opportunity for the company? How will this help his, his team succeed? And then coming up with a solution together. So initially the engineer manager was like, why don't you co like figure out what we need to do? And her response was like, can we do this together? because you have more expertise in this area and we can scope this out together. That way, when the work had been scoped out, because they had done been done it together, everybody was 110% bought in and they were able to have a smoother process. So while it takes more time up front, spending that, that time 
is well worth it because it helps the project be overall successful. Number five, active listening. Now I often get people thinking like, yeah, 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 I know, listen. But I don't think we often realize what that actually means. Active listening means that we actually listen to what the person's gonna say. For me, I am guilty of when I ask a question, I am already thinking about my response while that person has still finishing their thought. So to actually listening, it means that you truly understand and pay attention to what that person is saying, what their motivations are. It means coming in open-minded, asking open-ended questions. How would you do this if you were me? To understand correctly, this is what you're saying, right? How can we make this stronger? Working together to reach a better outcome. Now, one of the hardest exercises in a sense leadership program is practicing a day of just listening, no advice. And our members usually come back and say like, oh wow, I thought I was a good listener, but actually I'm not. So I challenge this to you. Next week, pick one day and just give no advice, just listen and pay attention to when you tend to jump in. One secret I'll tell you, usually we have struggle listening when we are on a topic that we really know about or with, with someone who we find intimidating or just plain annoying. So pay attention to those cues to help you become a better listener. And number six, building allies. In today's world, it's not enough for us to push our ideas on our own. We have to get others to support us. That builds social proof, that builds credibility. So building allies means that you have someone who believes in your message and is willing to advocate for it. These allies can be your team, reports, cross-functional partners, your manager, senior stakeholders, customers. So think about who do you need to have influence and start building relationships with them so they can help make your project successful. And you can have allies for your own personal growth also especially since the majority of the conversations about you, your performance, whether or not you should get promoted, happen in rooms that you're not in. So have these allies who can advocate on your behalf. In summary, these are the six requirements to get buy-in. In the workshop resources, you're gonna see a checklist with these six requirements so you can start applying them right away. Let me know if you have any questions. I am really excited to see how you implement this to help you be better product managers, and move up in your career. Thank you, Shivani. Up next, we have Chris Valerio. Chris started out her career as a journalist for Bloomberg, NPR, and CNN. She hosted and anchored a weekend show called Venture, featuring in-depth discussions with entrepreneurs. Chris quickly realized that she wanted to be part of the product world instead of reporting on it. She made a transition into product management and she's worked for companies such as international design firm IDEO and high growth unicorn startups such as Uber and Instacart. Chris is currently a product leader and angel investor. Please join me in welcoming Chris Valerio to the stage for her presentation, How Play Can Transform Your Approach to Leadership. Hi there, women in product. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm Chris Valerio. I want you to take a second and think about the last year of your life. What experiences stand out the most? If you were gonna describe the last 12 months in three words, what would those three words be? Go ahead and throw them in the comments. I was reflecting on this question the other day as I was talking with my partner. He's a seventh grade science teacher and was planning on returning to the classroom. So we were talking about COVID concerns as well as change schedules. And he mentioned in an offhand remark that it'd been such a lovely year for him because he'd been able to engage in other intellectual endeavors and take care of his health better. And as he's saying this, I had one of those out of body experiences. Like, wait, it's been a great year for you? Because for me, it's been the exact opposite. It's been a year of profound loss, of community, of possibility, of adventure. Has anyone had a conversation like this recently? As I reflected on it, I realized something about the past year. Whether it's been joyful or whether it's been demoralizing, the fact is we've lived some pretty big extremes. And as product managers, we know that 
outlier events or extreme users can teach us a lot. It's been particularly hard and extreme for women. As you all know, we are experiencing the first female recession is what they're terming it. At some points, we saw up to 15.5% unemployment rate amongst women. This is especially the case uh, for parents. But it's not just about women losing their jobs. In fact, the U.S. Census Bureau's Household Pulse Survey has consistently shown that among working adults, a greater share of, of women than men have been experiencing symptoms of anxiety and or depression. Now I want you to think about that for a second. Think about what it means when almost half of the women working in our country are saying, I'm struggling so much that this is impacting my health. Think about what that means for existing gender disparities in our careers. And here's the worst part. Before the pandemic, 68% of tech workers reported feeling burnt out across all genders. This is the extreme situation that I want to talk with you about today, and that is burnout. Our job as product managers necessitates the ability to inspire and lead cross-functional teams towards solving real, hairy, complex problems. It is my favorite part of the job. It is also absolutely untenable without energy. And here's the catch. For many of us, as the statistics indicate, it's been increasingly hard to bring our best selves to work. The problem is we can't really optimize our way out of it. As a technologist, I sure as hell wish there was a quick hack or a scalable solution to this, but there's not. I believe this is fundamentally about a paradigm change in how we approach our jobs and our lives. And I believe it's about learning to play. Yep, I said play. Kind of like this guy. Today's a little more so than I need you. Can't help but laugh watching that. What does play mean to you? I'm curious. Throw it in the comments. Do you associate play with a specific activity? Maybe it's a place. What about a smell? Here's what play looks like for me. My expression of joy in this world is moving my body through mountains. It's where I learn to focus on process. It's where I fail again and again and again. It's where I experience the full spectrum of human emotions. Most of all, it's where my imagination runs free. It's where my synapses fire and my mind feels on fire. It's in those moments when my mind wanders and I start to make connections between systems and ideas. It's where my creativity comes alive. There's of course science behind this. From an academic standpoint, the characteristics of play have everything to do with the motivation, not the actual act of play. Research tells us that play is defined as the confluence of several characteristics, four in particular. First of all, it's a self-chosen and self-directed activity. That is to say, it is intrinsically motivated. Nobody is telling me to go scare myself silly on a wall. Number two is play is an activity in which the means are more valued than the ends. There's no external reward for engaging in play, typically. The third thing is that play has structure or rules. Believe it or not, this one was surprising to me. However, they emanate from the minds of players. Have you ever watched kids and they make up games in the middle of the game? That's what we're talking about. Even climbing has its own rules created by the community. And finally, Play involves an active, but non-stressed frame of mind. So I ask again, think about it. Think about those four attributes, those four characteristics. What do you do for play? 
For my sister, it's dancing. For my former VP of product, it's farming, believe it or not. I always laugh thinking about him on his tractor. He's a Swiss machine. And yet, when he is on his tractor, it is where the lightness comes to be in this man's life. And for one of my engineers, it's playing the cello. I remember this moment so clearly. We were at a quarterly planning meeting, the entire room went silent, and we all had the honor of witnessing this other side of Peter that honestly was magical. You see, while play is the action, the magic actually comes from the playfulness, from the attitude involved in the practice. Did you see his face? I'm talking about the wonder, the spontaneity, and the laughter that comes from engaging in a playful activity. I transitioned uh, to working in technology um, through a global design and innovation consultancy called IDEO. I was coming off a career as a financial news journalist. Yep, that pictures me. <laughs> this woman takes herself very seriously. And you know, when I started working at IDEO, I began to receive some constructive feedback uh, to tread more lightly when it came to ideas and processes. You see, as a financial journalist, I was good at my job because I interrogated a subject. I poked holes in stories and I could strip a narrative down to its core attributes and once revealed, build it back up again. That's what made me good. But in design and innovation, I really had to learn how to hold many ideas at once in a nonlinear fashion. And to be honest, it's hard. It requires a certain playfulness, a an ability to hold possibility, a lack of certainty. The culture at IDEO actually furthered this tenet by encouraging its employees to have rich lives outside of work. Their thesis was that employees with diverse outside interests would actually bring a more creative approach and therefore greater solution set to solving really hard problems. Coming from Wall Street and the hyper-competitive culture that is journalism, this was absolutely antithetical to anything I knew about what it took to have a successful career. Go have more hobbies, lean into my creative self. But you know, of course it intuitively makes sense, right? Play is where you see a promotion of true intellectual curiosity. And there's actually a term for this. It's called playful intelligence. So research tells us that playful intelligence contains five core qualities, imagination, sociability, humor, spontaneity, and wonder. As a product manager, I think about this often. Playing is not just important to my personal health and um, growth. It's also vital to the culture that I want to drive as a leader at the companies I work at. You see, at the end of the day, I am a deeply ambitious woman. I want big impact in this world. But I'm also aware that the greatest impact I can have as a human is on the people that I spend most of my time with. And the reality is, at least 90,000 hours of my life, or a third of my life, will be spent at work. So I want to pause here for a second and I want to go back to that question I posed at the beginning. How would you define the last 12 months of your life? Have there been moments of spontaneity and wonder? Have you engaged your imagination? What about humor? To be totally honest for me, it's been really, really hard. In August, I started a new job. I was tasked with a high profile company-wide initiative and I threw myself at that project with a plume. I'm sure there are many of you like this, but I love a purpose. I also honestly just really enjoy bringing together big teams unaligned executives, and get working through hard issues. But the truth is I've never worked that hard in my entire life. It was relentless. And you know, it's a strange feeling to feel so intellectually engaged and so motivated and yet absolutely drained. But that's what it felt like. And part of it was the project, but part of it was certainly the pandemic taking its toll in my life. 
But after five months of working on this thing, I could see the end in sight and I was psyched. On the Thursday before our big launch, something in my body felt just off. I ended up in the ER that night as well as the next. You see, I was in the second trimester of a pregnancy that I lost that weekend. And I launched my project on Monday. Now, there's a lot I could say about this experience, and namely uh, the lack of language and how to have meaningful conversations around grief and productivity in the workplace. But the main reason I'm bringing it up right now is because of this. Play was the furthest thing from my mind, not just during the miscarriage, but also during that intense period of work. And that's where the tension is, right? I'm sitting here and telling you the play and playfulness are absolutely vital, not only for individuals, but for building high empathy, high performing teams. And yet I'm the first to admit that when push comes to shove, it is really, really hard to make space for that, to ground yourself in that kind of attitude. In the following weeks after my miscarriage, um, as I was really just trying to keep my head above water at work, I started trying to force myself out of the house into the hills nearby, moving my body through mountains, remember? And sometimes it was just a few minutes and sometimes it was more than that. And slowly I began to notice things like the smell of the eucalyptus trees, or I would pause and I found myself smiling at the little newts on the trail or the flowers starting to bloom. You see, little by little, wonder and possibility entered my life again. The good in life unfolds in so many different ways. And so do the stressors. Stress cuts into the playfulness of our personalities. Your ability to bring energy and playfulness is so important for impact in this world as leaders and as humans but you can't do it without finding sources of renewal. So I wanna end with this provocation. What are you doing to live lightly as you navigate the seriousness that is this life? I hope you are giving yourself permission to seek play, doing it regularly, whatever that might be. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. And finally, join me in welcoming Haifa Harb to the stage. Haifa is a product manager at Duolingo where she's focused on monetization. Prior to that, she was working with Duolingo's grammar solutions services. Haifa currently is, uh, Haifa completed her MBA at Wharton School of Management where she discovered her passion for consumer product, mission-driven tech and ed tech. Join me in welcoming Haifa to the stage where she will be talking to us about testing everything from storming to performing. Have you heard of type two fun? Type two fun is fun in retrospect. And I signed up for a type two fun experience about three years ago when I was in graduate school. I signed up for a leadership training that was going to be conducted through a hiking trip on the Appalachian Trail. I showed up on day zero, having never hiked or camped before. And I even showed up in jeans. But over that week, thanks to an incredible team, I became someone who hiked. I hiked for six days, 10 hours a day, wearing a 26 pound pack and not using a GPS for the majority of it. See, I always knew that teams helped us amplify our potential, but I don't think I fully experienced it until that trip. The other thing I thought is that to build a great team, you find a group of great individuals. But it turns out that alone is not enough. Building great teams is just like building great products. It requires intentional experimentation and iteration. So let's talk about teams. Have you been on a new team recently? New teams are hard. They're messy. They don't function well from the beginning. But it turns out that that's how they're supposed to be according to psychologist Bruce Tuckman, He actually identified four stages of group development. 
and see if you can identify them as I mention them. Stage one is forming. The group has just joined and everyone has a lot of questions, but they're excited. Stage two is storming. This is when the honeymoon phase is over. Conflict arises and people have a lot of questions about where we're going and what we're doing. Stage three is norming. There's clearer roles and responsibilities and we are making progress. As for stage four, performing, there's a clear vision and purpose and everyone is focused on goal achievement. What stage is your team in right now? Now think of a time when your team was storming, perhaps never really got past it. If you're like me, who's conflict averse, you might be tempted to think that storming is a negative sign, that conflict means your team's personalities may never work well together. But what if I told you that storming is actually one of the most critical stages of a group's life? See, it turns out that teams that skip the storming phase never learn how to deal with their differences. And those teams are actually more divided and less creative. Today, I would love to share with you three lessons that I've learned navigating teams from forming to performing, both on the Appalachian and at Duolingo. Lesson number one. Last year, I was co-leading a cross-functional team of 13. The team didn't feel very cohesive. It was manifesting in low participation in brainstorms, engineers not collaborating well together, and I couldn't figure out why. I tried a few things relating to brainstorms, but it didn't really help. And so I felt a little stuck. Where do I go from here? How do I find what my team needs to improve on? I learned about a process called an after action review while on the trail. At the end of every day, we would meet as a team with the mountain guides to debrief about what went well and what could have gone better. We'd identify things we wanted to change, try those out the next day, and then meet for another after action review and repeat the process. Sounds familiar? We decided to try this out on my team. And it was actually one of our engineers who shared, I sometimes feel like we're working in silo. And there it was. We had structured the work in a way that the engineers were not really collaborating together outside of our formal team meetings. And so the next quarter, we structured the work differently and it made a difference. So my first learning is set up processes to get feedback and iterate. An after action review is a vulnerable process. You're showing up to your team and saying, show me what's not working, show me how we can do better. But it's what's going to turn your team from a good one to a great one. Let's talk about the second learning. I recently, a few months ago, joined a new area in our company. And I was working with a new team member I hadn't worked with before. I was sensing some tension and frustration on their end but I wasn't sure what it was about, and if I'm being totally honest with you, I wasn't brave enough to ask. And I later learned that they had went and talked to someone who wasn't on my team about it. I was hurt, but I also understood. I've been there. How many times have you been on a team where you didn't feel comfortable or safe enough sharing what's bothering you? I've been there so many times. And so the question becomes, how do we create safe spaces where our team members feel comfortable to share? There isn't a shortcut, but there is a way. Building trust. But turns out, if you want your team to trust you, you have to trust them first. I asked this team member to chat and they were asking me how I was doing and Instead of giving a surface level answer, because I'm trained to not be vulnerable at work, I said, it's been a roller coaster. Building new teams is hard. I often feel lost, but I know I have a good compass and a great team. And as long as we're learning something new every week, that's what matters. Building trust looks different in every situation and with every team member. Sometimes it's being vulnerable. Sometimes it's going through a personality assessment session with your team and sharing your strength overplayed. Mine is responsibility. I tend to focus on the outcome rather than the journey. Sometimes it's a lunch 
where we ask each other questions about ourselves and our teenage years. Like, what was the first concert ticket you bought? Mine was Paul Van Dyke. <laughs> the lesson here is build trust, be vulnerable and connect with others. See, if we don't build trust, our teams will not feel safe enough to fail. If we don't build trust, they're not gonna feel safe enough to bring their experiences. And without those two things, it's really hard to innovate and create. Now, let's talk about the last learning. So on this hiking training, we took turns leading the team, being the leader of the day. On the day when I was the leader of the day, I divided the roles and responsibilities. I thought I was being super thoughtful about them. And we start hiking. Halfway across the hike, I notice one of the team members is disengaged. We take a break. I ask them how they're feeling and they say, I'm fine. I'm not a body language expert, but I can definitely sense when something is off. And so we go back to camp. We are sitting to debrief in the after action review and they shared that they felt excluded because they didn't have anything to do that day. You're probably thinking it's not always realistic to always have an active task for a team member, but the reality is engaging groups is hard. And so how do we keep our teams engaged? Think of a Zoom meeting where you weren't engaged. Now think of one where you were. What do you think the difference was? I recently stumbled on this simple but very profound realization when a team member asked me to facilitate a meeting that I normally don't, simply by sharing my screen. I felt more involved, I was sharing my thoughts more, and I was more engaged. See, when we ask for active participation, team members are more likely to show up. And so we recently tried this on my team. Instead of me presenting and facilitating most team meetings, as a product manager usually does, I have started asking team members to take turns in facilitating or co-facilitating, and it's been much more fun. So my key learning is ask for active membership. It's become increasingly easy to disengage behind a screen in a virtual world. And so how can we make everyone feel included? Before I share three things you can do next week, let's recap. Number one, set up practices to get feedback and iterate. Number two, build trust, be vulnerable, and connect with others. Number three, ask for active membership. If you're interested in learning more about these ideas, seeing sample after action review structures, and my favorite list of get to know you questions, download this talks resource sheet from the app. So what can you do next week? Number one, schedule an after action review with your team. Either do it for mid quarter, or when you think you're gonna have a big product release. And talk to your team about it. Get them in this mindset already. Number two, schedule a meal and go through some get to know you questions. You'd be surprised what you can learn about team members even after working with them for quite a while. And finally, ask a team member to co-facilitate a meeting or part of a meeting. Whether you're a team leader or team member, don't be afraid to challenge the status quo. Don't be afraid to care. Show up and ask, how can we do better? On the last day of this hiking training, we had to do this exercise where we wrote a letter to the students that were going to take this training the following year. And that day was a hard one. We woke up at 3.30 in the morning. We hiked for 11 miles, discovered we needed to hike for seven more because we miscalculated. But we did it together as a team. And sitting there writing that letter, I realized that all that mattered was those little moments when my team lifted me up and I lifted them. And so I wrote, welcome to this community where you learn that what you do in life is as tied to who you are as who is doing it with you. See, I believe in this radical notion that we are better together, that when you believe in someone, you help them unlock a part of themselves that they didn't know existed. And that's what my Appalachian team did for me. That week on the trail, I met a version of myself that I hadn't met before. And I can confidently say that it changed my life for the better. 
And it turns out that we can do this for ourselves and others. The secret that is not so much a secret for how we do it is building great teams. Thank you, Shivani, Chris, and Haifa for your engaging discussions. I know I learned so much from each one of these and I hope you did as well and are able to take some real tangible takeaways back to your work with you. Just a couple of housekeeping things. Women in Product is really interested to hear about your feedback regarding this conference. Please take a moment to review the sessions and rate them directly in the app itself. You can go to the agenda and uh, select rate and give us your feedback on each of these sessions. We hope that you join us tomorrow back at this stage for our next session, which will be cross-functional leadership that inspires.